Very simple. Um, the Civil Rights Bill had passed. I lived through what, watching Dr. King get killed, and, along with a lot of my colleagues in here, and what was going on in, in, the, in the time, 1968, but I had just got an office service, and three months later, they had killed Dr. King. So then, my forward, the Civil Rights Bill passed, and all sorts of stuff. And um, we had went to a community meeting and we were talking about well, what was the, because the Democrat, um, the Republicans was going to get in again and we all died the Republicans were going to get in. And I went home depressed and I was saying to myself, well this situation is just as much internal as it is external. And if we would reach back and help each other, we would rise further up. Now, they know how to, you know, to illustrate that. And I was watching the game, thinking, you know, these fellows in my head, and this huge basketball player was taking a foul shot with his huge shoulders and long arms. And I said, that's it. That's it. And he held his head down. So you couldn't see who it was. Now, if I had to put a face on him, it would have never been the same. Because somebody said, oh, that's Frank, that's Peter, that's whoever. Right? So I held his, held his head down in my illustration, my first little drawing, and I put the hands together. They were actually holding each other. And I said, no, 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 that can't be. Because I answered the question for you. But if I did like Michelangelo, the creation of man, the energy there between the, that, that, that image, right? So I open the bottom hand wide open because if it has a fist, you got a closed mind. We can never help each other. The struggle would be too hard. So I opened up the hand and I pointed one down. And the first piece I did was in, it was in black and white. It was 60 inches tall and about 27 inches wide. And I, uh, a guy came over to my house who was a uh, professional athlete. And he said, man, I love the piece. How much is it? And I thought, hmm, oh, cars cost $3,000. So I said, $3,000. <laughs> and he said, OK, we were on the track. Oh, and nice. I said, oh, Lord, I'm not <laughs> So then I said to him, um, I want to make some prints. And he said, okay, and I said, I'll deliver it later. And I went out, made some black and white prints, limited edition, 300 limited edition. It cost a whole $25. Mm. Peace. Peace. Yes, and people were crying, oh my God, man, you're trying to kill us. But a few months later, I had no more prints. And I said, I am in trouble. I cannot make any more money of this piece. But the rules say, if you change it, it's a new concept. So I painted the picture in full color. And there you have the story of my dear Heavenly Father. So, now, well, I really would like for them to say something I got a question. Like on your Obama piece, what happened to the original as well as your He Ain't Heavy? Oh, we have those. We have those. Oh, we're not mess we have had so many offers for that original Obama piece because I called once we did it and I was trying to put a value on it. I called I, I called Sotheby's and Christie's to say what kind of value do you put on a piece like that? 
and they said that the only way they assign a value to a piece is if something similar comes to auction, and that will. And they said there are no painted portraits of any U.S. presidents with the president's signature on it. You have the only my, one. My, my, my. So, my, so, my, my. so we have that original in, in a secure storage, okay. and it is a, a legacy for the. Well, how about the how about the Michelle Obama piece? Well, the Michelle Obama piece went straight to the uh, to the people family. paid me for that, yeah. okay. so it went straight to the White House. Okay, somewhere in their archives, yeah. um, they they have it. Yeah, okay. um, and the original he ain't heavy. We have also in okay. store. Okay. Nah, nah, nah. The original. One of, one of the things that 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 I would try to advise these young young artists is uh, try to hold on to your creativity as long as you can, especially original. And that make your artwork affordable to the masses of people. And but do put out a quality product so that they, you know, listen, why we were successful early in the black art career was because black folks would start buying homes. They were not buying art, they were buying decoration. They decorated their homes. And if, if you had the right color, that's why a lot of people were very more successful than I was at that, at that particular time. I just outlived them uh, as far as, you know, physically and, and monetarily. Uh, what happened was they had houses. And they were buying houses. And y'all yeah, remember they would, they would tear your arm, you know, keep you along with the arm and all this sort of Stuff to get you in the house and then jack you up later on. Okay. And I didn't realize it took me over 20 years to figure out what happened to us in, in this art market. And we had two things that happened. We had foreign invasion, Indians coming in here setting up uh, frame shops, biggest work in Atlanta. It was servicing all over the country, about five major frame shops there. They hired Mexicans. They framed up a work. They created a program to talk about there's two ways you sell it, wholesale, and then there's another one is uh, not retail, but uh, distributed price. Distributed price is one quarter of what your original artwork is. And then they even went further because they said, look, if you sell me a hundred units, hundred units, instead of me paying you fifteen dollars, but I'll pay you uh, ten dollars for a hundred units, right? And all of a sudden we had a pocket full of money, but we didn't realize that we were selling against ourselves. Because oh, they raised they, the price before they sold it. They, they look at the time you could buy here had for sixty dollars. And they could sell one for framed up for forty. Okay, because when I sold something to them, it was a sixty dollars. Half the price would be thirty. What's the next price? Fifteen. Right. So they, they said, "Well, we'd like to buy more from you. So if you bought a hundred at a time, give us a break, and you give them a break." And it's now ten dollars, and they put twenty dollars worth of product material in it, and then sell it to anybody for sixty dollars. I put it into all of that. Okay. I put it into all of that. Thank you, Queen. Yes. So she made me get out of it, but uh, that was the that was the business side of the art world that in. Uh, we were able to, before then, the, I call them the elites and the educated uh, part of our community who were all professors and who had degrees and were teaching. They were the people that, that the world saw first, but their distribution was small. And they were like, and, and the one thing that they, they told this lie to most people, you don't want to do prints. It devalues your work. Mm. Yeah. That is a lie. Amen. Okay, it's the biggest lie I ever told. Mm -hmm. All right. If I can sell a million, he ain't heavy. What 
is the value of he ain't happy. All right, tell them. The original, right? So that's how they how they fool most of the young artists in out here and then galleries. Galleries was notorious. Galleries don't want your name out there, especially your address, because now they go straight to the artists. And then we then we then when we did this what I call the chitlin circuit, you know, traveling all the up and down and stuff. We were self business people. Self employed. That's it. That's it. Government didn't know how much money I was making. That's it. I never told them. I got caught once, so. I lived out of New York. <laughs> we did a show and I didn't tell them how much I made. <laughs> and they just assessed how much I made and made me pay taxes on. Yeah, right. But um, that's the business side of it. And hopefully, we understand. What I would like to do is teach us, the consumer, the value Absolutely. of having something. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Because yes. guess what? I'm at my fourth quarter playoff. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to touch down now. Okay. <laughs> and if you don't have one of these, you'll never get it signed by me again. And that's what the value of, of something, especially if now I was a you know, conservator, a restorer of art. I became a master restorer. I worked for rich, white people and company. I worked for, you ever heard of Flashman Yeast and Butter? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. I worked for their collection. They had thousands. I was the one who was cleaning all this stuff. Okay, making sure that well, I understood the value of what they did and how they held on to something and what they do. Why don't you explain what that term means? What's that? Conservative? Yes, sir. I restore paintings. When they get damaged, I can restore them to the original condition. I can make you not see the rips and tears and whatever is in the, in the, uh, in the canvas. So I had to match everybody's style and uh, learn how to surface the techniques, the glazing, uh, the modeling of the paint, how they put it on, and and just the tedious. Now, the greatest thing I ever did in conservation was this. I took the canvas off of the paint and put a new canvas on. They took the canvas, old canvas, completely off the paint itself and put a new canvas on. Okay. And I don't want to know how I did it. How would you do that? All right. First thing we have to do, we have to stabilize the front of the canvas. Mm, mm, mm. We use waxes. We heat the whole board up on a heat table mm -hmm. and it melts the wax. Mm -hmm. We put the canvas on top of the wax face down. Mm -hmm. okay? And then let it cool off. Then I would take a scalpel from a doctor's kit, shovel mm -hmm. blades, and I would scrape down to the white part That's that is right. called the gesso. Mm -hmm. Once I got there, I'm sitting there going, spread, 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 I'll be long, spread, spread, spread. The end of a surgeon. And then, once that was done, I took another coat of wax, put it on the back, put a new canvas on it, flipped it all the way over, and then just warmed up the top enough to get it off. Wow. Now I chemically clean the extra wax on the front of the paint, and then I stretched the blue canvas onto a stretch. Wow. Thank you for sharing. So, and just think, my mother, who was a nurse aide, saw this guy in the hospital who went nuts, 
Okay. You got alcoholic, love homosexual. Okay. Okay. And he just had lots of problems and he had to go into the psych ward of the hospital. And she saw his chart and it said, Restoration Artist. You know what it was. So she bugged this poor man. He's tied down. So it wouldn't hurt himself. And she's showing him drawings that I did. And said, my son needs a job. And he says uh, to her, how old is it, your son? And uh, she says, 16. And he said, well, but he's too young. He has to be 18. When I got 18, my mother said, uh, there's a job waiting for you. Your name is Baron Adams. Here, I'm writing you this note. And the note said, hi, Mr. Adams. This is Gilbert. You promised him a job. And she didn't know what to do. There's a Negro in his office, in his in the studio, and uh, he just said, oh, 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 okay. Well, uh, you can clean up. So this guy was white? Yes. Was he Jewish? Um, no, don't know that. But he was uh, real shy and real timid. And uh, one day, I had one of the scholarships to, to the art academy, and one day when I came in, I came in after school, and he wasn't there, and I got a chance to look around, right, in the shop by myself. And I was just looking at paintings and picking them up, and, you know, looking at them, and the door slammed down the hall, and I dropped a painting on the corner of a table, and I looked at the price, Oh, by the way, it was the same price that I sold my artwork later on. It was $3,000. And I said, Lord, I'm going to lost this $20 week job. <laughs> so I again fixed the, the painting the best way I could, and I put it back in the racks. And when he wasn't there, I would pull it out, do a little bit more on it, because I watched Tim Hyde. And, I, and uh, one day I came in after school. And he was sitting there with the painting on his lap. I always got there at the same time, right? And he said, did you do this? And man, big crocodile tears started rolling down my face, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, come with me. And I said, oh, God, I'm going up to the fifth floor. And they're going to give me my seventh check, and I'm gone from this job, right? And I'm just. You know, but she didn't say anything. She said, come with me. Believe it or not, it was like a movie. The elevator people were black. Uh -huh. They were running up in the elevator, you know, open the door and then. And he said, he said, first floor Fletcher. That was his name, for real, Fletcher. And we went down to the first floor and I thought, oh my God, he's kicking me out for real. Now I don't have a job. My mama gonna kill me. And he, and he said, follow me. And I'm like, what? Where are we going? He went around to the art store. He bought me $500 worth of material. Easels, paints, holly night, everything you think of. And said, now I want you here every day. Wow. And that's wow. how I got started. Wow. wow. Bless your mother. Yes. yes. Bless your mother. The, the girl, praying girls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell us the story of the praying girls. First the three little girls. Oh. The three little girls that are praying with their no. with the little ponytails. That's not me. You give me more credit than I deserve. Oh. I never hated three little girls with ponytails. <laughs> praying. Thank praying. Okay, you know, after a while, you don't know what to create. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. take it. So, so, after he brought you that art set, what, is, what did he actually have you do starting off? The same thing that he did. Restoration. Okay. And he watched me, and he was so mean, <laughs> and so hard on me, that I told my mother that I was going to quit. And my mother is very colorful. <laughs> 
she said something about my derriere. Okay. <laughs> okay. What she would do to it okay. if I quit, and then I would have to get out at the same time. <laughs> and then she said something to me. Mr. Adams is giving you everything that he has. Mr. Adams died about four years later. Wow. And I took over. Head man in charge. What? And the United States Army said, Ah, uh, the president said, well, That's not good enough. Mr. Young, we'd like for you to serve in the Army for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I was drafted into the Army. And um, the first time I was drafted, I was really was drafted at the, to the age of about 19. But I had started working and I had known a bunch of rich people that knew how to get me out of it. But I had to fill out a report or he asked me questions in the document out okay. there. So I'm almost 24 and he sent me the letter again and I said, oh Lord, if I go down here again and lie, these people won't send me to jail because you, they do say you, if you lie, you, you're subject to go to jail. So I told the woman, I said, well, thank you, Dad, I'm too old. So I'm ready to go now. I, I felt, you know, uh, my mother, I don't support her anymore. She's on the own, and I told her all kinds of life. And um, they sent me the letter the following week. And the next thing I know, I was in the service and being trained. And um, I was so lucky. I saw a guy drawing on the day room wall. And I said, man, what do you do? He said, well, I'm an artist. Well, he was a lousy artist. <laughs> and I said, you're an artist, and you don't go out in the field. He said, no. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I just draw these pictures from him. I said, man, Lord, I went to PS. Captain <laughs> <laughs> Drum Pass, good, stayed up all night. <laughs> and uh, on regularly, I fell out, and they called, you know, South Africa. And Young was always glass with wigs and all this stuff. And uh, they got to me, and I said, here, of course. And then I said, hey, first time, just take a look at this. Right? And he looked at him and said, damn, these are good. Where'd you get these from? And I said, I did it. And he said, Johnson, pass out in the field. <laughs> what? And I took the job. <laughs> Whoa. Now I'm in there going and going, and, uh, he, and uh, the hotel got wiped out. Oh, the news media hit that, and everybody was uh, upset around the country. And so the first sergeant said to me, Sergeant said to me, um, Young, I said, Yes, sir. He said, Can you paint murals? I never painted a mural in my life. Right? And I said, Yes, sir, first sergeant. He said, Well, you're going to paint this solidated mess hall that I want to eat, and I want a picture, and I want something beautiful on here, and I want something about the army, and blah, blah, blah. blah. He said, It better be good. So I went to the army library and got a bunch of pictures of different wars and uniforms and all this sort of stuff. And I hated good, you know, mess with them. Had George Washington on a big white arch, you know. And they loved that shit. <laughs> and had the green go red, the green go red would pop again and it would kill us and all this sort of stuff. Had them on one side, had this on the other side. And then it had a big unveiling of the press in El Paso, Texas. And here come the press, and here come the colonel of the base. And they all went, well, this is wonderful, this is one who did it, uh, probably Young did it, blah, blah, blah. And the wife of the colonel said, um, probably Young, can you do centerpieces? I didn't know what a centerpiece was, I think. I said, yes, ma'am, I can do centerpieces. <laughs> she said, good, because I need you. 
And she turned to her husband, and this is what she said. I'm hosting the West Point dinner this year, mm -hmm. and I will not be denied of success. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to make him a Titan artist and give him a, a, a promotion of spec four. Wow. Now, now I get to go to the officer's club because that's where the event's going to be, right? And she arranged the whole office in her head to her husband. He said, well, what are we going to put? She said, you got two clerks. Each one got off. They don't need to have me. She said, she can put the desk over here and put the this over there and this, that, that, that. Just like, and, <laughs> and told him what it up. Now I'm, uh, you know, I'm on spec four before everybody else. And now I'm in headquarters, headquarters, and I had the title of a Tangan artist. And of course, I wore it out. Okay. <laughs> now here's the other funny part. So she calls up. I'm sitting, well, I got to go down to, to uh, uh, supplies. And they said, get anything you want in the way of material. Well, I only just have a bunch of technical stuff, you know. Uh, uh, Compasses and stuff of that nature, but not no party stuff. Uh, and a few paints and all this other stuff. And I got everything I could, desks and everything, and um, and tables, drawing tables and, and stuff. And I'm sitting there, nothing to do. I'm just sitting there, get up in the morning, get real sharp, and act like I'm somebody. And <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and she calls and she says, Becko Young, you need to meet me at. at, at, uh, at uh, the officer club in 10 minutes. And I said, man, I, I can double time and I can make it in 20. And she said, you don't have a vehicle? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> she said, wait there. What? The end of the guy from old pool came up and said, where's that damn guy? Respectful and young. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, you're a now I got a vehicle. What? And they gave me a vehicle. And I did a wonderful job. And I got decorated at the end of my life. I have the centerpiece painted. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? I have the centerpiece. How did your centerpiece How did your centerpiece that you did for oh, her? It was great. I'm an artist. I did flowering cactus. I ain't crazy. I did a flowering Cactus come here in Texas, El Paso, Texas. All right. Come on now. I get these big flowers, on huge flowers, and you know, buy them at what those uh, those stores, you know, what those you know those junk stores where they sell these. Like Milo's store. Yeah, not it's not Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree. Yeah, they have Dollar Tree. No, they had Dollar Tree. They had stores that sold junk jewelry, junk flowers, and all sorts of beautiful stuff together. I found I found a little cactus plant and that they had and I stuck a flower in it and pushed them up and everybody was happy and then I did a big bull fighting scene. You know, Matador and all this sort of stuff. And it, you know, and they loved it. And I got decorated for it. At the end of my career. So I know plan all this is just God's will. And if you if you keep on track, you keep doing what you're doing, like you're doing here, eventually Eventually, something great happens, and it always does. It comes in little pieces, but it always does. So I, I know I wore you guys out. <laughs> we loved it. We loved and, you know, it. And, uh, thank you for listening, and any, anything, any other questions? You must tell everybody that your gift will make room for you, because that's just what you just said. All right. That's good. All right. I, I guess you guys had enough. I can go on and on. Go ahead. How would you compare our generation of artists and the way they worked to the younger generation today? Well, they haven't learned a uh, work ethic yet. That's it. Because work. it had come too easy. Okay. Our generation had little to nothing and had a, a lot of things that we created was 
was not the instructions or someone that was there to teach us. We just had the is the desire to create. And and many of us was not fortunate enough to go to school and learn the techniques. And I got a full scholarship to school, but I had to quit. Because I didn't have enough money to even buy the supplies. Okay? That's why I was running to Mr. Adams and right after school down there trying to trying to get enough money. That twenty dollars was helping me stay in school. But when I found out that I could make more money, <laughs> I told him, hey, I won't be back to school. I'll see you guys later on. Okay? Because I was learning from him everything about art that I could. I was working on masterpieces. Yeah? And their, their work ethic today is a little, um, they don't, they're not disciplined enough for me. They, Anything easy they will do. That's it. I learned to draw well because I would draw things that I couldn't draw. Mm -hmm. Once I mastered that, then I was a better artist. Most artists can't draw hands. I got hands all over my head. That's it. Okay. Most artists will draw from here to here. I had partials, I had bodies, I had arms, I had legs. I interpret the story mm -hmm. fully. Most artists think that if you just draw a pretty head, most of our art is just from here to here. Mm -hmm. And it's portrait. They're portrait artists. But in order to convey a message, it has that, that portrait has to do something. These three little girls are not looking dead at you. They're doing something. Three little boys, they're not looking dead at you except the one because he's been brought a frog to church. <laughs> and the other ones are looking at him laughing, he's going to get in trouble. Okay? So, when you look at what's happening now, and hopefully, that one of the reasons I was here or brought here is always something beyond what is really obvious and invisible to, to me. And I met two, three young, great artists that are going to be following in the footsteps of all the other great artists that we know about and knew of. And, and, and they are going to carry on the legacy of our art. It's not going to be an abundance of them. It never is. If you look at history, and you look at what we've done, it was always one. It was never a great deal of us, right? So if you believe what you believe, and you believe in that Bible, it was one Jesus. It wasn't a bunch of Jesus walking around, okay? If we look at the Civil Rights Movement, it was one Dr. King. If we look at, 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 at the, all these things that have affected our life, it was only one person. One of the greatest things that happened to me was a realization when it came back to me. I got sent home with a note that said, Gilbert, spend too much time in class daydreaming. Mm. Seemed like a hundred years later, when Mrs. King gave the okay for the design I did of Dr. King salute this to break this award. I was in the company of a, a dreamer. Mm. All right now. And all of us have dreams. All right now. Don't be afraid to challenge your dream and and um, you know go for it. This ain't nothing but a game. If you lose, you don't lose. That's just an experience. If you got losses, that's just life. My son, one of my children, OD. The best thing I can do for him is to live well and be somebody. Because otherwise, I will support. I'm here, he's gone. We lose, I'm gonna go, you're gonna go, 
everybody in this room got to go. We need people to carry on the dream. We need the young people to step up and make this happen. You know, and we have to tell them about it. And we make it bigger than what it is. Make it always bigger than what it is. I used to tell my wife, she will always tell my son how smart he is. Absolutely. All of them. All, all three of ours. And one of them hated school just like me. The oldest one. Okay? He hated school. But we told him not to, oh, I'm going to get all of them. What was it? College prep. My wife said, no, he tried to play football at one time. She said, she packed his football equipment and, and turned it in. Because it's really dry. Right? So, that dream is really real. It becomes real. I want to do something. I think about it. I talk about it. I sleep. That's it. And, I, and it comes to full position. That's it. And that's what, what happens. And, and especially if you have a good mate. One of the worst things you can do is marry a dream killer. <laughs> okay? No, you can't. And boy, you all did now. Because as soon our voice will not be heard anymore. And nobody in this room, hundred years from now, what we have to say, can we preserve this spot? Will we do what is necessary to create this into a dynasty? Now, my wish for you guys is to get together. Biden says he's bringing money. Get some of that money. Write a grant that's so big that they say, what's wrong with those Negroes? Okay. Don't be asking for $50,000. Ask for $50 million. Okay. <laughs> What they gonna say? Y'all really got no. What they may give you half. You already got history here. So who else in the city has done more for the arts than you got? I don't know. I'm gonna live here, but I'm pretty sure that you have some kind of record that he, uh, he had said and he had told me how long you've been here and what 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 you are doing. But don't think small. I would like to see a building sitting here with this inside the building. Mm -hmm. nah, nah, nah. Like right, right. I would like to see a building here with this house sitting inside the building. And said this was the beginning. But if you don't challenge them, it will never be anything but small. A great man said this. I read this one time. If you believe in God and you're a child of God, then playing small does not serve God well. All right now. Mandela. Yeah. Wow. Right the truth. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, that was really a treat. Let's give uh, Gilbert Allen another round of applause. And also thank you, Wendy, for working with me and getting the artwork here. It's been a, a truly an honor. Uh, Tanya Starks introduced me to Winfrey, and we got the ball rolling, and we got the show put together. So I just want to say to everybody, um, support the arts. Support your local galleries. Come out, support, tell somebody. This place should be full, overflowing. Because... Whoever missed this tonight, they really missed a treat. So.